Hi everyone, welcome to uh, another episode of the Teacher's Point of View. Um, really, really excited about um, having this this superwoman of a lady onto the show this episode. Uh, we've got Tamina Begum, who's currently the head teacher of Forest Gate Community School in Newham. I mean, it's it's a tough area in general. I mean, I'm, I'm from East London myself. I know Forest Gate, and I know a lot of areas that are kind of surrounding the school are fr- like really deprived areas, and they're, they're children from like sort of difficult backgrounds, so to speak, aren't they? And um, yeah. obviously, in the school, you, you've done phenomenal well to try to like understand your community and actually become a part of the community and take them on a journey where they feel like they can achieve um i mean i don't want to sell we in too much what you do i mean tamina can you kind of introduce yourself and kind of the journey you've been on yeah um so hello everyone hi tj thanks for having me on it's actually i feel quite privileged to be invited on um i am the head teacher at forest gate community school it's a secondary school based in newham um, it does serve a disadvantaged, um, rather disadvantaged area. The demographics are changing um, recently, so it is changing quite a lot. So it's a very diverse community that we serve. Uh, I've been at the school for, this is my eighth year now. So I'm an English teacher by trade. I started in the English department as a second in charge. And since I've had various roles, so assistant head teacher in charge of English, then moved on to deputy head teacher in charge of teaching and learning, like in charge of CPD, staff training, all the fun stuff. And then um, two years ago, I became the head teacher in 2020, right in time for the pandemic. So that's a brief whistle stop tour of my journey in Forest Gate. Talk about getting your hands stuck in the first year of headship, right? I mean, <laughs> how's it been? How has it been? Yeah. Um, it, it's been as crazy as a pandemic. You, do you know what? I, I I really enjoyed it. I didn't think I would. I didn't think I would. I thought it'd be, I knew it would be very difficult and it has been, but I feel genuinely really, really privileged to be, to get to head up a school like this. Like I've got amazing colleagues, a brilliant leadership group, um, staff who will run through brick walls for our students everything that a head could ex- to, could wish for so I've got I'm very lucky to work with amazing colleagues and it makes my job a lot easier especially in a time like this yeah absolutely I mean sometimes kind of like like being together and actually having a team that supports one another I mean that kind of comes from the the, the mentality of the leadership in some respects because you've got to try create that culture and try to get people to be like share your vision and and come on this journey with you and that comes from you in some respects doesn't it um yeah. and, and I know Forest Gate has been cut on a massive journey I mean it, it's a top performing school now but it hasn't always been and you've kind of been there with the changes haven't you I mean what do you think kind of like changed and what, what did you have to do to to get it to where it is well um I, when I first started I think it was 2013 um and it, you're right it was very very different it was a very different school back then there was a you know expectations were very different uh, the culture uh, work ethic those things were very different and it was a slow journey but you you we built momentum with you know, staffing and speaking to people across the school and changing expectations, you know, having high expectations. That was one of the biggest things that we had to instill across the school. Um, Allowing students to believe more about themselves, that they're able to achieve more. And what we found was that spread very quickly. Uh, Starting with the English department back then, it was uh, kind of like just below national average kind of around that but quickly that changed where we embedded you know foundational basic expectations in the classroom and that spread on a department level um, and from the department level it's where we saw that practices were working really well and you know it was raising attainment and raising standards generally we kind of spread that across other departments as well so over time you know we went from RI in 2013 to outstanding within two years and then we've maintained that and the results have improved year on year and fundamentally what that meant was our students who were achieving not you know not to their standard not what they were capable of now are leaving with one grade better than their equivalent national counterpart so it's amazing life chances that our teachers are providing students like ours coming from Newham 
and they're going out into the world now with lots of opportunities and doors that they can choose uh, to go through for their future. So it's a really special thing. Yeah, amazing. I mean, what, what do you think you kind of had to do to implement that? I mean, you, I know that you before that before we started recording, I mean, you said a big part of that was the, the teaching and learning as, aspect, wasn't it? I mean, what, what kind of did you have to embed to, to improve the quality of teaching to make sure that you are giving these kids the opportunity? Well, I mean, in our specific context, in the right in the beginning, it was going back to basics, uh, having certain kind of non-negotiable expectations of what what a good lesson what a good what good learning looks like in the classroom and that we found I felt wasn't there or wasn't clear and achieving a level of consistency once that was established you know I came at a time where students didn't really have exercise books or you know, consistently some were eating in classrooms some were, some were watching videos for a whole double lesson just just not good practice basically and so we had to fix the things that were not good. So establishing what a good lesson looks like, features of a good lesson, making that really clear across the board, having a level of um, follow through. So, you know, do I know that this is happening now that we've established it and following that through and then checking and then supporting colleagues. So lots of training was needed and I always emphasize the need of frequent training because it's drip feeding, it's drip support, isn't it? Because one time never works. You have to do it over and over and over again. And it's kind of a combined approach like that. So you've got your monitoring, you've got your accountability, but you've also got your genuine support as well. And that support is in the form of uh, scaffolding, training, providing the resources, asking what, what else do you need? Um, training up mentors and line managers to know how to support their, their teams and members of their teams. So it's really a very comprehensive combined approach. And over time, we found that, you know, like the, the whole flywheel uh, notion, it was difficult in the beginning, really, really, everyone trying really, really, really hard. And over time, where systems were established, and I worked under the leadership of a very inspirational leader, Sham Udin, who's no longer with us now, but she as the leader of English back then, put in place systems that exist today. So for us, relatively speaking, it's so much easier to maintain and continue those systems that she set up. Um, so things are in motion now. It's so much easier compared to back then. And our challenge now is to continue, you know, such high standards and the expectations that we have and continuing that support so that we're maintaining those amazing results for our students and, and improving their continuing to improve their life chances yeah amazing I mean look just kind of for people that are are listening I mean uh, look, for some for some teachers I think one of the things that they they think that needs there needs to be more in, in education and that's autonomy like and, and some teachers would would say look I mean we, we kind of want to like be left to it and kind of get on with it but I think ultimately this is public taxpayer money we want to make sure that the kids are getting a good quality education so I mean it's hard to get a balance between the two isn't it it's like you don't want to breathe down someone's neck but you also want to make sure that they're doing the best for the kids so how do you get that fine balance? I mean, you know, it, I think it's alignment with a vision, isn't it? Fundamentally, what's our core purpose when we, you work in a school? It's students learning and their safety. We can ensure those two things. Um, and we agree upon a vision that ensures those, then everything else should fall into place. And really, it's often relational. It's often, you know, your conduct with each other propping each other up as well as being having a climate where you are able and comfortable enough to account each other as well but where where that does happen having a common understanding that well, why are we doing that you know why are we having these conversations or that that monitoring and that checking which is important it's important because if you don't ultimately you could be failing the children and that's always what it comes down to and I think autonomy is important and autonomy um you must have it, but there is always there must always be parameters of um, of quality of standards. You know uh, what what's that phrase? Um, freedom through structure or something like that. I don't know, but it's it's we we love our systems in in Forest State and this, the systems that we've set up and established 
though we evaluate them quite regularly, they have meant that we have maintained a certain quality and standard that has meant our students leave with really good life, life chances. So definitely maintain that autonomy, but within a framework of excellence. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's always going to be naturally difficult because some teachers naturally, work, it, won't, it won't work for some, it will work for others. And it's about kind of making sure that you find the right personality fit for you as a school, isn't it, in some respect, and that kind of buy into the vision. I mean, like when you're kind of in a situation like you were in maybe 2013, where maybe you were and you needed improving. I mean, I, I, was it that much more difficult to try and get the right people to come and work at the school? Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, definitely. You're talking about a completely different culture back then compared yeah. to what it is now. People don't like change. That's an inherent thing. Yeah. You know, it's a natural thing. And there were lots of changes there. And sometimes and again, it goes back to what did that mean, though, for the children? Children were leaving with grades that they were so they were capable of so much more. And so change needed to happen back then. And we needed the right people on the right bus so yeah. lots of kind of th those discussions happened but and, and it was difficult and it was difficult for me personally because I was a 2IC who looked about 16 years old and I was coming in as a <laughs> fresh out my NQT year so it was difficult but I you know it, it takes time you develop professional relationships you develop that trust over time you also need a core team you know a, um, a, a handful of people who will work really hard with you and you can really trust to drive that vision forward and I was very lucky to have that with my line manager with uh, with my colleagues in the team as well so. yeah I mean I'm going to ask you a bit of a question now I mean it's it might be a little bit difficult but some some would question having two, like systems quite reg regimented systems kind of kill creativity and innovation I mean like what, what would your argument be against that my argument would be it's not that binary. You need you need you can still be creative and innovative. And I believe forest teachers in Forest Gate School are very much innovative and creative. You only have to look at some of the excellent teaching and learning practices that um, that are occurring and occur every day. But to ensure a level of quality and to do right by the kids and our responsibility as leaders, you need systems. You definitely need systems to to make sure that it is of good quality. So you it's not one or the other, you can have a combined approach there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like in terms of obviously kind of where, where you feel education is, I mean, where, where do you think education is at the moment in the UK? And do you, do you feel like it needs to evolve from kind of what where we are? What a massive question, TJ. Um, it, it's a really complicated one, isn't it? I, I mean, we were chatting briefly about it before. For me, there it, we, we live in a place where education is affected by so many external factors or, you know, things that we can't, we're not in control of as people on the ground, leading on education on the ground. And so... I think there's only so much you can do with certain things, externally driven things, and there's lots more you can do on a local level. So as leaders of schools, you know, there's things that we can do to support this national crisis of retention, recruitment and retention. Yeah. And one of the things that Forest Gate Community School is doing, alongside the trust actually, so the Community Schools Trust, we're part of three schools in the Community Schools Trust. One big drive that we have had over the last year or so, specifically has been a particular investment in the quality of mentoring and coaching for our new staff, our trainees, and generally people who have a mentor or a line manager. So when I, when I say mentor, I mean anyone who manages another person and their role is to support them um, and, to, and, and to account them as well. So the school, you know, we've looked at our systems and how that supports that so that we are making sure that the quality of mentoring is of a really good quality. So we've looked at, you know, uh, meaningful targets we might give, the quality of the conversations we might have, emotional intelligence and, and those who might need that support with that. Um, follow through. So, you know, not sitting in your office all day long, giving targets and emails, but actually getting on the ground, getting your hands dirty and looking around 
uh, and looking into what people are doing and really supporting them on the ground as well. So lots of efforts. Oh, and the other thing is uh, we've, we've started a, an instruction coaching program this year led by our fantastic assistant head teacher in charge of English, Yamina Bibi, um, who, where we are assigning coaches to members of staff across the school. It's a completely voluntary thing. And they meet with them once a week and they talk about kind of, you know, where they want to go in their professional practice. And the, the, she uses the phrase, we, we are eliciting the brilliance from our colleagues. So there's loads of kind of efforts going into making us better practitioners and having those genuine conversations that will make us better in our practice. And fundamentally, that goes back to what we love about our job. And if we're having those conversations and we're really trying to improve our practice in the thing that we love, we're going to enjoy our job. We're going to enjoy what we are doing on, a, on an everyday basis. And let's face it, we, our professional lives take up more hours of our life than probably our personal lives, especially in teaching, right? So we've got to enjoy it and we've got to invest efforts as a school, as leaders, to make sure that we are focusing on the right thing. And if we're doing that and we are enjoying and we are getting better as practitioners, which, by the way, will help the students, the other things that are annoying, like the state-sanctioned pressures that we feel, won't feel as bad because you're working in an environment where you love the colleagues that you work with, you love what you do. So for me, it's what, what, what do I have control of as a school leader on a local level? How much can I influence that? I'm going to put my efforts into doing that because if I do that, not only will my teachers hopefully love what they do so much, they're never going to want to leave. Um, hopefully others will hear about it and they're going to want to work in a place where they see such great things happening and people enjoying themselves. And our students will leave with amazing life chances. So that is my answer to that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the key things that you said there was you, the reason why you do it is because ultimately it's because you enjoy what you do. But I think that there is, a, and just to kind of add to that, I think obviously as educators, you go into teaching because you want to make a difference to kids' lives, you know, and I, I think ultimately the kind of right training, the right um, practice and, and kind of the teaching and learning, especially about pedagogy and making sure that you're, you're actually developing a curriculum that is going to be like helping these kids to actually succeed in life post-school. I mean, like, obviously, when I sometimes speak to my nephew and nieces, like, when I ask them, like, what have you done at school? They're like, this, this and this. But I'm like, okay, so what, like, how can we make that relevant to you, you know? And they often kind of come back to me and say, look, well, I'm only doing it because I want to pass an exam, you know? I mean, like, actually about, it's, it's not necessarily, they're not inspired to learn about it necessarily, you know? It's sometimes I feel it's very much information focused and actually that exam focused, whereas actually in the 21st century, those softer skills and those emotional intelligence, pers uh, being personable and like kind of having confidence and those sort of things are so much, well, not so much more important, but they're just as important, but we completely forget about them in the curriculum. I mean, like what, I mean, we, we kind of spoke a little bit earlier about the kind of things you're, go, you're doing. I'd love for you to kind of explain what, what kind of initiatives you've brought to the table recently. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think they are pr probably equally as important. And it resonates with me personally as well, because, you know, I see, I, I see our students who leave with really good grades and they come from particular, particular backgrounds, which might not be shared in the world of work if they were to go into like, a I don't know, in finance or top quality top university, they're going to be around people who have very different backgrounds to them. Um, and I saw this, I think it was a documentary on Channel 4, where the, the student was very much like a Forest Gate student, you know, disadvantaged background, very bright, did all the things that society expected of him uh, when he left school, got good grades, all of that. And then when he got to an interview setting for a job, he completely crumbled because he didn't have the soft skills to give a good impression of himself. You know, he couldn't hold a conversation in a way that was articulate and confident. And that really resonated with me because growing up, I didn't have those soft skills. I didn't, uh, nobody explicitly taught them to me and I wasn't naturally exposed to them given my background. And that's very much the, the case for a lot of our students in Forest State. They're not naturally exposed to um, developing those softer skills in their life. And when they come to school, they're in an environment around their teachers and their friends that they're very comfortable with. So 
So yes, they might be confident in that in that environment, but as soon as they leave, um, you know, how confident will they be in a setting where everyone looks different from them or people around them haven't shared the upbringing that they have had? So what we've tried to do as a school, especially this year, is have a particular focus on developing confident, articulate speakers at Forest Gate Community School. We use that phrase, we want our students to be confident, articulate speakers. And the way that we've tried to instill that is we use the acronym SHAPE. So we want our students to shape their responses when they speak. So if they're called upon in class or if they are um, spoken to in the corridors by the teachers. So all our teachers are in the corridors when we were in corridors. And when we say good morning to them or good afternoon to them, we expect our students to shape their reply to us. So it's an acronym that stands for, uh, S stands for full sentences. So speak in full sentences. H stands for speak with your hands away from your mouth. A stands for be articulate. So articulate your speech, no mumbling. P stands for project your voice. So be confident, let the room be filled with your voice. And E stands for give eye contact to the person you're speaking to. Now they might seem kind of, I don't know, people might say, oh, you know, why are you doing it like that? It's so prescriptive or it sounds a bit basic. But if you think about it, if our students haven't naturally developed those softer skills, Which speaking without mumbling, you know, when they when they go into the world of work or leave school and they're in environments where they haven't picked up those softer skills, they don't have the habit to do that. And actually, when students speak with mumbling or hands in front of their mouth or quietly and timid and meek, you can forgive them because they're children and they're still learning. But if, a, if an adult spoke like that, yeah, it, can you imagine it? Speak, mumbling in an interview setting or, or oh, not yeah. giving eye contact in an interview setting. It's... You, you you can be you're less forgiving as an adult aren't you so for me and for, for our school we want to instill those good habits that will set them up to develop those softer skills mm-hmm. to be able to feel confident in situations and environment where where it is unfamiliar to them so it's a, it's a big oracy push and really naturally building those habits and at first it's going to be a little bit unnatural for our students Absolutely. But we yeah. are pushing them. We are saying, no, no, no. We're insisting, okay, project your voice 10% louder. Um, give me eye contact. Now rephrase that, but with a full sentence. And in doing that, and if they're getting that message from every single teacher that they encounter, whether in the classroom or in the corridors, what we're inadvertently doing is we're allowing our students to build up those really good habits that will mean that they're developing those softer skills. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very important. And you say that it's softer skills. I mean, they're, they're, they're very much essential life skills now, aren't they? And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's so many times where I've actually interviewed somebody or I've spoken to somebody that's got a first class honours in their degree, academically brilliant, but they've just got no, nothing about them. Like they're literally as bland as paper. They've got no personality. They don't know how to talk to somebody. They don't know how to, I mean, I had somebody that had a first class honours came to interview at my, at my previous company and they were like, what do you do? I mean, they haven't even done any research on the company before they came. I mean, like they thought we were an internal recruitment agency, Jesus Christ, you know? And it's like, what, what are we actually preparing children for? And I think I was speaking to a lady called Ruth Morali and she's uh, she's basically, a, uh, she's had a career as a solicitor and but what she kind of worked with is recruitment people and, and big CEOs and what she explained was that the, the the gap between the workplace and school is is huge because what ends up I mean what ends up happening is those those apprentices that they've taken on because of the lack of personal skills those confidence lack of confidence those interpersonal skills it takes them four years to train them because of like how far behind they are on that side you know and and it's I mean, I think there's one thing about learning knowledge, and that's great, it's important, but realistically, how often in real life do you have to sit there in an hour and a half, inquire, and actually, like, um, and, and memorise information and put it down? I think it's very important to learn knowledge and be able to apply it, but I don't think necessarily exams will always get that best out of you. I mean, if you've got subjects like politics or history or law that are very vocal subjects and they're about debating and, and very kind of back and forth with each other, then, but you actually are only getting assessed in an exam at the end of the year. I mean, that's not going to be a true reflection of what the kind of career that the, these people, these children might necessarily go down, you know? I mean, do you think that's something that we kind of need to embed into the curriculum? I think as, far, as long as 
league tables exist, as long as, you know, our children are judged based on grades that they receive, schools are going to carry on giving them that because we know that, you know, what do I want for our children? I want them to have the best chances in life. Mm. And at the moment, getting good grades means in the world that we live in, those grades are going to set them up by opening doors for them. But it doesn't mean to say that. I mean, look, exams, there's loads of opinions about exams. One of the things that it's not just about what they're regurgitating, they're, they're learning. And we've, we've really looked at our curriculum, actually, as a school and as a trust to make sure that what we're including in our curriculum is are things that they will take with them for the rest of their lives. It's not just for the exam. So it is knowledge rich. It is something that they we aim for them to know more of and to remember more. Um, it's it's broad. It's looking at things that you know they're going to be able to relate to but also in life things are boring so them sitting there through a, a lesson that they a subject that they might not be passionate about that's that's not necessarily a bad thing because and lots of our students realize this when they go for work experience by the way and I'm sure lots of school leaders will say the same thing when they go away for work experience in their chosen professions or things that they that companies that they've decided to go and um, have the experience they come back saying oh it's so boring it's so dry miss and I'm just like well that's 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 the world of work as well you know it is it's not a fun fun and games all the time and part of all of these things that they're doing they're learning they're learning skills like resilience they're learning skills like uh, discipline when I when something is difficult or I don't particularly like I still got to persevere and do it because actually if I try I might actually get it so they're learning lots of other things aside from just, you know, performing in an exam. So I think there is merit in that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, look, it's great that you're doing it, and I mean, look, you're you're a really. I mean, you guys are very much kind of innovative and and trying to focus on actually doing the best for your kids, being a part of the community, making things that you teach are relevant to them in some respects, right? But I think it needs to be across the board because there's many schools that aren't doing it, you know. And it's about kind of giving every child a kind of an opportunity to succeed, and and you know, and it's a shame that there's like I mean, there's, there's schools in Newham that aren't performing like you, and that those kids just because of where they're born, like they're not going to get the same quality. Of education and those life skills that you're able to offer you know and, and I think you're absolutely right league tables is a kind of a, a reason for that in some respects I mean where, where do you stand with league tables because you're a top performer so I mean it's, it's always interesting to hear your kind of views on, on like what what league tables bring to the table league tables bring a load of pressure on school leaders and then they end up doing things under that pressure that is not very nice for teachers who they need to be supporting and the children that they need to be getting good grades or best outcomes from. But again, I think it's a difficult one because what, what can we control here? What can we control here? If it's, if it's externally given, um, there's not a lot of control that we have. League tables define the success and the future, our life, the life chances of our children. And as long as, for as long as that exists, schools will continue to compete for that whilst at the same time try their best uh, for their children in all the other ways that they possibly can but there's a lot of pressure there so I do sympathize with schools who find that difficult um, and we can only do our best I think where we're competing with each other because of these league tables actually we work in a profession where there's amazing collaboration as well so I think we, you know, that we really should try more of that, you know, learning from each other, sharing the great practice that is happening in all of our schools, uh, constantly re-evaluating, refining, taking stock of what's working, what we can get rid of, and all of those things, because we, we have to understand what our, what's in our control and what we can do to change things where we can. But it's a tough one. I don't have all the answers. To be yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I do 100% get what you're saying. But I, I, like, in my opinion, like, I, I don't think we should have league tables because there shouldn't be competition in education. We should be working collaboratively and, and making sure education is moving forward for everybody. You know, and I think that there's a there's a growing in numbers in terms of how many people feel this way. They feel like, you know, like 
in Finland, I mean, one of the one of the beautiful things, I mean, we don't have to copy what they do, but one of the beautiful things about Finland is, let's take Helsinki, for example, every single school in Helsinki is on par with each other, you know, and it's about kind of, they know that if a child is going to the school down the road, they're going to get just the same level of quality of education that they're providing in their school. And when their school is maybe like kind of needs improvement or whatever, they work together collaboratively to make sure that school is cut, comes back up to par. I mean, is that the kind of model we need to move towards? I don't know the answer to that. I think it does that that element of pressure. We definitely needed to move move away from this whole kind of competition element of pressure. I think the people deciding what, what our students are up against need to be people on the ground actually doing the job. Yeah. I think there has to be a lot more of that than there is at the moment. Um, and you know, look at this year and last year. Suddenly, league tables aren't there anymore, and there's there's a a great big void where everyone's trying to figure out what's going to happen for our for our students and what does that mean for their life chances yeah you know, so there's there's it's 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 very uncertain and the unknown is quite scary for for us isn't it yeah i mean just you know like i was i was reading kind of i've been reading a book but in terms of obviously the last hundred years we've worked so hard to like bridge this gap between the advantage and the disadvantage and now covid in some respects has thrown that completely out the window and we're gonna have to play catch up again to try to bridge this gap you know and, and what we, i mean we can't take another 50 to 100 years to try to bridge this gap so what do we need to do to actually try and make it education like give a chance to every child, not just the ones that are good at exams or like that are, are good at memorizing information or the ones that are, because like, like we said before the podcast, some kids work really hard, but we still only ever get C's. But some of them actually, like I've found, are like got a lot of grit about them, are, are got great work ethic, got great enthusiasm. And actually as an employer, that's far more attractive to me in the industry that I work in, you know? And, and it's many employers that I've spoken to, like uh, colleagues or other recruitment owners or just like CEOs in companies and they very much don't look at the GCSE grades anymore. For them, it's about finding a gem in, uh, finding a, a diamond in the rough, so to speak. You know, it's about kind of finding someone with a bit about them that's going to challenge ideas, be innovative. So, I mean, like, look, we just have to only look at the last sort of year and say that, it, like, the world has changed so much. You know, I mean, like, and, and like, the world is forever changing. So, what we need, what we need to really be thinking about is how do we prepare children for the forever changing world? Because, like, I read an article the other day, and you, you like, they they talk about kind of in the next 10 to 15 years majority of the things we do now are going to be automated so where does that leave the future workforce and, and ultimately if we continue to teach them the things or we'll keep focusing on the things that we've been teaching them for the last 50 to 100 years ultimately all we're doing is is preparing them for the same work opportunities that we've always prepared them for you know and those kids that aren't going to do well in those exams are going to get left behind and forgotten about you know, so what, what can we do to make it more incorporate, like incorporative for these children and give them a chance to? Yeah, I think, I mean, we mentioned, I mentioned it uh, briefly before, but I think it has to be a combined approach, isn't it? Of course, we're going to teach them the academic subjects and things like that, that we, that we must and make it as, as, um, as rich and as productive and as high quality as we can. But alongside that, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. Lots of schools have initiatives of, uh, you know, instilling cultural capital in our students and um, making them well-rounded individuals. So one of the things that our school does is the Master Mission Programme, which was started up by our previous head teacher, Charlotte Whelan. And it was, it's a really good kind of uh, programme where our students follow it via their PSHE lessons. And it's a list of kind of missions or tasks that they're, their tasks to complete over time and they're all non-academic based and it allows them to be exposed to things that they wouldn't naturally be exposed to so for example one mission might be visit a famous landmark and learn about its history or you know go home and cook your family a three-course nutritious meal or uh, do xyz so the the tasks are designed to develop the student beyond academia you know their confidence their understanding of different cultures or their cultural capital um so i mean it's a, it's a really good initiative and it's something that happens alongside all the other important things as well and i think you can have a really good comprehensive combined approach that develops them as individuals that with skills that they'll be able to use when they do go into the world of work uh, that they don't necessarily need to rely on their academic abilities 
Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, that's a really good initiative, isn't it? I mean, it's it's about kind of exploring those other skills that are just beyond academics, you know. And I think that is is, is so important and relevant to the real world. And I think that it kind of needs to be embedded in the curriculum. I know you're doing it, but I think it needs to be embedded into the curriculum in some respects too. Because I mean, like what we're doing at the moment is we've got the core, and then what we're doing is having innovation around the core. But I think in some respects, the innovation should be in the in in the in in the. Oh, middle. you're right. I agree. I mean, it, it is. It's it's actually PSHE is a, is a curriculum in itself, but we've opportunities to discuss, to debate, to find out beyond a given specification. It's, yeah. It should be a thoroughly um, thoroughly embedded in in our curriculum, and it, it shouldn't be an add on, and yeah. it isn't. So they, what, you know, we're often refining what our curriculum look like, looks like, what how else we can adapt it, and part of what we do our school leaders do when we're looking at our long-term planning and our medium-term planning is how else we can embed opportunities where it allows students to develop those skills as well while setting them up so yeah definitely it should be yeah absolutely i mean like even just things like telephone skills and just like you know like manner and just yeah i mean it, it's it's so important isn't it especially like kind of with with the way the world is changing and it's about kind of adapting and being able to adapt and having grit and work ethic you know those are things that kind of go a long way and in some respects i find sometimes when children leave school like they want things to be like to land on their lap you know and it's that kind of you have to go out and work for it but one of the things just to kind of pick up on a point that you mentioned a little bit earlier is is obviously sometimes you get bored. I absolutely get that. But what, what we shouldn't find is it, it for it to take 18, 21, 30 years for a child to find their passion. You know, like it, it, we should, I mean, we should be able to like, like a school in some respects should be in creating and installing this passion into a child. So by the time they leave, like they can replicate that passion into things that they do that or that they enjoy and actually have a career out of it because like you love what you do. I mean, imagine waking up every morning and think, oh God, I've got to go to work. Like, I mean, I, when, I, when I'm passionate about something, that's when I feel alive. That's when I really want to actually work hard and do something about it, you know? And I think sometimes kids leave school without that. And that's so sad. You go through 18 years of your life without ever feeling passionate about something, you know? I mean, look, it's a bit depressing, isn't it, TJ? I think <laughs> the, I, I would say our children, the students generally at Forest Gate, they're quite happy. Uh, you know, they're, you, they're kids as well. They're teenagers. They're not going to talk about loving their maths lessons and their English lessons. Well, a lot of them do, actually. But it takes years to find what you're passionate about. I didn't know what I was passionate about when I was 18, 16. But that's um, cool, though. Took, that's because of the system. But, no, but... It, it, but you also need to be exposed to lots of things and yeah. have the opportunities to or, or the the options to find your passion and the way that I see it what we're doing at school where we're raising the bar where we're having high expectations where we're not being apologetic for having high standards we are equipping the students to, when they leave to have a plethora of opportunities that they can choose from to explore eventually find that passion and and I think there's and I think that's the right thing to do because if if we're just focusing on you know developing passion there and then it's it's quite limiting because we don't know what that is but if we give them a breadth of things to get good at and and uh, know about and remember they get to choose that in time there's like full-grown adults who don't have a passion they're still exploring it yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing. But uh, but that's the thing. Like we, for the first time, they find in their passion is out a lot, like sort of in their twenties or their thirties. You know, I mean, that shouldn't happen. I know you. You it's important to teach a wide range of subjects because you can change your passion at any time. You can change your career path, and it's about being able to adapt. But to never feel that passion or feel alive or feel that kind of hunger to want to succeed for 18 years of your life. I mean, in the nicest way possible, I get what you're saying, but in some respects, that like having a system like that is failing children because when children aren't excited and they're not wanting to learn, I mean, you've got kids that want to learn maths that are passionate and that they're naturally going to be good at it or whether they, they found the love for it because of their teacher, right? But that's because of what the teacher's doing. They've installed that passion and it's like teachers are like their job in some respects. because anyone can go and Google and find information, but it's like the love of learning and that's what you install into them in some respects and when a kid is passionate about something they go work hard for it naturally whether they do well or not i mean if they feel like they, they're passionate about it, they want to make a difference or have a vision like that is that is education in my head like you can't replace that 
I think for me, if the children are learning, I'm there, I've made it. If they're passionate about it, it's a cherry on top. I think you can change your passions. I was really passionate about Walker's Cheese and Onion Crisps for five years of my life when I was a teenager, but I changed my passion. And I think it's, I mean, I joke there, it was meant to be funny, but you, you're, they're kids, they're still exploring that. And when they come to school, if they're, if they're able to enjoy being about, you know, being with their mates and having a laugh in their English class and also learning at the same time, mm. that's okay. But they don't, I, I think passion is such a broad thing and it's very subjective. And it's also that it, it will change a million and one times before you decide to stick to something. But their experience and their um, journey through school should set them up to find that eventually. But for me, as long as they're learning, that's equipping them for the later things in life. So I think that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not trying to discredit what you're saying by any means or what you guys do at Forest Gate or what any educator or school is doing. And I, I'm not, I please, like, I think you guys do amazing stuff and, and you are helping kids every single day. I know what you've been through in terms of over COVID with the free school meals and like how above and beyond you've actually gone to give these children an opportunity. But I think, again, like, when, when, I mean, I've spoken to a lady called Alison Creel and she, she went, took over a primary school in Hackney back in like, I think, 2010. And the school was failing. It was in the bottom 1% of, of the whole country. Um, and then what she done was she actually took away time from the core subjects. And actually what she done was installed a, a, a love for learning. So like she, if a kid was really good at Lego, she brought architects in and kind of like show that they could potentially make it and make it relatable. And she, she took like every child had to learn an instrument and um, she, like, they took them around London and looked at different parts and museums like for free, you know, and it's, it's about inspiring. Them. Actually, what they found was that the attainment grades went up and actually they were the top performing primary school in the whole of the UK. Well, one of the one of the in the top one percent in the whole of the UK. And what they found was and that was from actually taken away from learning in the core subjects. But they installed passion and inspiration into the kids and they naturally like were able to replicate that because they built from success instead of like trying to come away from failure, you know. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, I just think, look, I mean, it can, look, I, I think every every child is different and it, it's kind of making sure that we're doing the best for these children ultimately. And it, it, look, I'm only asking these questions and playing devil's advocate. So we can start asking the right questions and we can start moving education forward because not yeah. everyone's going to agree with everyone, you know, but ultimately it's about asking these questions and making sure we are doing right by children ultimately, you know, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Do you agree? Like, I mean, do, do you think that it kind of there could be some room for, for improvement there or do you, are you quite set on the way that you're doing it? No, absolutely. I think that this is, it's incumbent upon us to always question the way that we're doing things and, you know, what we could do better. And, and that evaluation is a very important part of our roles, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, it's interesting that the example that you gave about the school in Hackney, um, it's interesting you said that they became the best performing school did you say? In London, after, after those in the top, top 1% in the UK, yeah, or in England, sorry. Yeah, so, but again, your, your, your parameter of success is what, the, what, the, um, what they left school with. So, so it's not just that. I think, sorry, I think maybe they explained, but what, what, what they found was from the kids not wanting to be there to running into school every day, they were excited to learn. And I think that for me is what school should be about. You should be excited to want to learn. You've, you kind of like are, are going in with a mentality that, you know what, you're going to you're going to leave something by the end of the day, you know? Yeah. And, and there's a lot of kids that don't feel that way is, is what I'm trying to say. Not from Forest Gate in particular, but I mean, in the system. Yeah, yeah, there and there will there will always be a lot of kids who feel that way, um, but there will always be a lot of kids who don't feel that way. And I think it's the measures we're taking, the things that we're trying to do to to enable our students to to feel that way at yeah. the same time as um, you know equipping them with the learning that they need that will make them successful in life. And I think it's a it's a difficult balance, isn't it? And it's it's a, it's, a, it's a real challenge across schools, especially with the pressures that we face. Yeah, I agree. And again, like kind of like those kids that will always be OK with it. I mean, I mean, they will always enjoy it in the way that it is. And, and that's fine. I mean, they're always going to go on to do well. But it's about how we're going to incorporate those kids that aren't enjoying it, because that's how we're going to bridge the gap between the advantage and the disadvantage, really, isn't it? So how are we going to excel these children that aren't actually the system isn't working for? And that is where we kind of close that gap, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, I mean, that's just my opinion. I mean, that's that's kind of how I feel. But ultimately, look, education is, is on this wonderful journey and, and it's just about kind of embracing it and, and seeing where it goes. And and I think one one thing that we kind of need to do is, is take the power back from politicians and actually to the educators and, and actually let the people that know what it feels like to be in a school to actually like be a bigger, bigger contribution to the, the policies that are made because you know what it takes in the school to get these kids go up and running, you know? I mean, like, do you think that's just something that like needs to change? Do you think that needs to come back to educate is the power? 100%. We, we, we know what it takes. We know what success looks like. We know what failure looks like. And it only makes sense to have people on the ground inform policies that affect people on the ground. It just it just makes logical sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's great that you're saying that because some people w- wouldn't say that. But it's it's like I have so much respect for you s- for saying that because you, you are in a top performing school and like it's, it'd be so easy for you to say, no, the system works. I mean, it works well for us. So it works, you know, and but I, I completely respect because you are doing the best you can with the kind of limitations in some respects that you have, like from the external factors, like you said earlier. And you're doing amazing things. I mean, I know you've got a massive following in Forest Gate. You're always doing teaching and learning. I know you've got the podcast and people respect what you're doing. But I think ultimately what we need to be doing is, is incorporate and collaboration throughout the country and let educators do what they do best and, and come together and take nuggets from what each other are doing and actually let's move education forward. So every child has a chance to succeed, not just the ones that are in, intelligent or academically bright or that are good yeah. at memorizing information, you know, and that's all I want. I want to give every, every kid a chance. And that's what this podcast is all about in some respect. So, I mean, it's good to feedback from you and hopefully we, people will listen and, and actually take on all things you've said that they feel is good and and then maybe it, it kind of work it in their way so really appreciate you coming on no problem I pleasure mean, is there anything you want to add just before we call it yeah you should become a teacher tj <laughs> i feel like i'm stopping you i feel like i can do more good from the outside now i mean uh, uh, I don't want to do it just at one school at a time. I feel like we need kind of somebody like outside of the system that can actually make an impact and actually work on it as on a mass basis, opposed to just one school at a time. So, I mean, I'd love to maybe 10 years ago if I didn't have my own business and stuff, but I mean, I, I still want to impact education in a positive way. And I hope, I hope like within, by the end of this year, we'll, we'll start making the right changes because if we go back to an education system that was prior to COVID, I think we would have missed the trick. You know, I think this is a great opportunity for us to really reevaluate if education is fit for purpose and if we're giving every child an opportunity to succeed. And if the answer is no, then we've got to be looking at why not, you know, because that is realistically how we're going to like reduce the gap between the advantage and disadvantage. Yeah, I think what you're doing is, I, I, I joked about it, but you sh- if you wanted to become a teacher, you should. But I think what you're doing is really important. It's it's great that you, I mean, it's, te- it's called teacher's point of view and we don't get that enough so it's a really great platform that you have here I appreciate it and that's the thing when I like when when I kind of heard what the media was saying and, and politicians were saying I was like but we never actually hear from the people that are doing the job like after after NHS you're on the front line so I mean what yeah. does it actually take to move education forward and uh, I just hope that we I mean we've got loads of people on now but I mean hopefully we can kind of learn off each other and, and, and move education forward and that's all I want really so yeah I appreciate you coming on and everyone that's watching thanks for watching and uh, yeah we'll see you in the next episode take care thank you